everybody, I'm Tia Fidia. I'm our Chief Marketing and Education Officer, as I've recently rebranded myself to all of our client offices. Um, I'm so excited to be here and introducing everybody to Cheryl King, our new Chief People Officer. Cheryl, can you just talk to us a little bit about like what is a Chief People Officer? Like what is what is the job? What are you what are you guys doing over there? Yeah, so the I think the traditional phrase for a chief people officer was chief human resources officer. Um, so that's kind of more, you know, traditional old school, the way to think about the function. Um, our people function is really being responsible for the experience that all of our team members have within the organization. Um, I actually did a career day, uh, let's see, a couple weeks ago for my um, my 13 year old seventh grade class. So it was actually sixth, seventh and eighth and they all came together and you know, parents who volunteer come in and, and taught the kids about what they do. And so I was like, how do I explain to sixth, seventh and eighth graders what this is? And so I, I had to put it in a lot of, you know, terms that maybe the, the kids could understand. But at the end of the day, the thing that they all resonate with is like what it feels like to be at, you know, your school or what it feels like to be at your company and the experience you have. That's really what my team and I'm responsible for. Um, so I think that's kind of the simplest and easiest way to think about it. I love that so much. There, there's like something really magical about going and explaining things to, to children because it really forces you to distill it down in a way that literally anybody can understand. And what's always funnier is hearing them say it back to you, what you just said. So there was one time I asked my seventh grader, like, what are you thinking about doing when you grow up? What would you like to do? And he was like, what you do, mom? I was like, this is this is going to be good. Um, and what is that? And he said, you help people have better lives. And I was like, oh, oh my gosh, that's so awesome. <laughs> I love that so much. I love that. So Cheryl, like, you know, you talked about how people feel when they're at work um, and that being a key component of what the chief people officer is is focused on. Can you talk to me a little bit about what that means and, and what you've experienced here at Health Equity so far? Yeah, it has it, it's so many different things. I, I think at the, the base of it is do people feel psychologically safe to show up as their authentic self, to contribute, to speak up, um, do they feel seen, heard, valued? So does do people know that I exist here? I have a role here. My role contributes to the bigger cause that the organization is pursuing and it matters and and people know that. So that that is like a really big part. So it's psychological safety so I can show up and be myself. It's this idea that I, I am seen, known and heard and I'm valued. Um, the other is that what you want out of your work experience is very different than what people wanted truly pre-pandemic. Pre and work motivations have changed over time, but specifically the pandemic really was a wake-up call for so many people and the realization that, you know, life is unpredictable. And so I want to make sure that when I'm spending my time at an organization, I'm giving my skills and gifts to an organization in exchange, I want to know that the organization cares about me and what I want out of a work experience. So there's a mutual exchange, whereas that wasn't always the understanding in you know earlier time periods. And I don't mean earlier like 1900s, I mean like five years ago, 10 years ago, <laughs> it wasn't the full. And so now it's a mutual exchange. So what people want to get from their work experience, they want to be paid fairly, equitably, they want to know they have the opportunity to grow either professionally, financially, or both. Um, that they're going to be recognized when they're contributing. They're going to have clear expectations so that they have the ability to achieve what they need to achieve. They're going to feel like they connect and they belong to a bigger thing. Like people want to belong. And you think about sports teams, if anybody's a fan of a college, you know, team or a professional sports team, like there is a sense of belonging that comes with being a part of that community and and people want to feel that and they can feel it in their employer there's a great opportunity to feel it here and so that's a big part of like what it feels like to work here and then the other thing is just do people help each other that's the big thing like we're all each other's teammates and so do you feel like you're working with people who want to help you be successful who want to support you 
Um, and, and that feeling is what, dra you know, dramatically Im impacts your work experience. And so awesome. It, it definitely makes a huge difference. And, you know, I'm, I'm recruiting right now and talking to so many people about what they're looking for in environment. And there's such a massive shift to your point than what I was experiencing a couple of years ago, what people are looking for. And it's exciting. It's actually really thrilling to talk to candidates and, and talk about who we are and the impact we make and our culture. And people are like just really drawn to it. And I think so many more people even right now are drawn to the impact side of it and being able to articulate that right now. It's just really exciting to be a part of. Yeah, I would also, uh, you know, I think back to earlier in my career, I would get, um, I would, I'm going to use the phrase made fun of. That's probably too strong. <laughs> made fun of for being the soft, feely HR person. And I was, I was always that person that was thinking about how was that thing going to make someone feel? And so I think early in my career as an HR and people professional, I had to suppress that part of me a little bit so that I could be taken seriously as a leader in the organization. And what's really exciting for me as a people leader um, who cares about all that is now there's no need to suppress that part of me. And in fact, that part is celebrated because that's what people need and want in their work experience now. So it's such a great time and period where um, I can show up as myself and I can be the person who's asking about how this is going to make someone feel and, <laughs> and, and that matters and it's a really important part of your experience. Absolutely. And I think about um, even you know, I had the opportunity to, to chat with you before you officially joined um, Health Equity. And one of the things that I was really struck by was your deep compassion and care for team members and really building that culture that's going to help build inclusiveness and bring out the authentic expression of, of all of our team members and their best selves to show up. I know that was one of the things that I was really drawn to with you. What were some of the main things that really drew you to health equity? Um, I, you know, I got to meet with a handful of people like yourself um, coming to the organization. And one of the first things that I was really impressed with is the mission and the fact that this is a business that really actually wants to make a difference in the world. And, and the difference is not just a, you know, a financial difference in the marketplace, which a lot of companies, you know, they're really focused on just the numbers. And by the way, we have to have numbers in order to take care of people. So like there's, there's an awareness on my part that yes, a company needs to be successful and financially successful in order to fulfill their mission. But I've seen in, in many companies where the focus is just on that and it's not in order to or in, you know, pursuit of, whereas at health equity, it is in pursuit of a really um, deep and true and personal mission, which is to improve and save lives and, and help people live better lives by making sure that they have the access to the health care and the financial wellness that they need. That is something that like I think anybody can get behind anybody I, I think that's huge so that to me was really key also the just the kindness the kindness and the support and the human nature of this organization um I went my, my second week here went to the sales and relationship management conference and I was blown away by the level of personal sharing that our leaders were getting on the stage and sharing about themselves and the vulnerability and the willingness to share with the intent of creating awareness and the intent of humanizing everybody and being a people leader. Anytime you get to humanize people, I, you know, I will celebrate and, and cheer for that. So being humanistic and caring about human impact, whether it's internally or externally, was a huge draw for me. Uh, the last thing I would say is being a, a HR people professional, I understand where health savings accounts come into play in the grand scheme of an employee um, experience when you think of our, our clients. And I also understand it's way under, under, like people don't understand it as pervasively as they understand most other parts of like a core offering. So I think of it that way. I'm like, wow, we are really truly at the early stages of something that is going to be so common in, you know, call it three, five years, it'll be so common and we get to be a part of that journey. That's pretty cool. 
That is that's that is a pretty incredible um, opportunity and an experience. And you are reminding me the Sales and Relationship Management Conference. I had the opportunity to see you. That's my first time to get to see you present live. It was unplanned. So poor Cheryl's on like day two or something like that um, starting up and uh, there was an executive panel. John, mm -hmm. I think, was was maybe the facilitator of the panel and, and Steve was up there and a couple of others. And so John starts talking about something people related and then all of a sudden it says, well, well, wait a second, why am I answering this question? We have our chief people officer right here and he pulls Cheryl onto the stage and um, and he did remarkably well for somebody who was brand new, unplanned, unexpected with a room full of very eager team members to hear what you had to say. How was how was that? I, you, OK, so <laughs> I will, in full transparency, I love the stage, so <laughs> I never ever shy away from the stage. I remember when I was, you know, in my early, early, you know, 20s kind of college year, um, Tony Robbins was really big and I, I might mm -hmm. be myself by talk, to, talking about Tony Robbins, but I was like, I want to be like Tony Robbins. I want to be on stage and I want to inspire and I want to motivate people. And so I don't shy away from the stage. So anytime I get the opportunity, I am always welcome to it. So from that regard, that was no no concern whatsoever. I, the I was getting questions on things that I am by no means an expert to speak on yet because I was so new. So I I was more um, a little nervous about making sure that I didn't come in acting like I know a bunch of stuff and I'm in week you know I'm in day six and so I was mindful of I don't know anything yet and I I want to be respectful of the fact that I still need to learn a lot. Very good. Well, you did a great job, and um, I was particularly impressed um, by that moment. And I and I actually thought to myself, this is a great trial by fire into 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 some of the shenanigans around here. So, uh, no, that was really wonderful. One of the other things that happened at the Sales and Relationship Management Conference is I reminded everybody of my love for Aerosmith mm -hmm. and longstanding adoration, specifically of Steven Tyler. And and Cheryl texted me a picture of Steven Tyler. And so I Cheryl, I just have to ask you, like we all have our favorite celebrities maybe stuck with us irrationally for extended periods of time like this one. Um, who like tell me about like the celebrity, like do you have a celebrity fandom that you've you've got? I do. My favorite celebrity is my husband. <laughs> so I would place him there, although he's a um, uh, I would call it a 90s and 2000 era celebrity, um, which is the connection to Aerosmith because my um, husband lived in California for 20 years. He lived in the Jim Morrison house. And so a, a lot of these, you know, rock band and, and their managers would want to come through and see the Jim Morrison house. So all of a sudden he got all these connections to the music industry because he had lived in that house and made all these connections so um he i would put him right at my favorite celebrity i am i'm born and raised in ohio i grew up in a very small rural farm town in ohio so to me someone like him was on a poster in my bedroom not someone that actually was real or existed um and then lo and behold he's actually from lockport illinois so he grew up just like me he just happened to um enter into a, a lifestyle that I had I thought was fake I'm just on TV and wasn't like real people that's so incredible uh your favorite celebrity is your husband do you have any memorable celebrity encounters uh which celebrity encounter well so I didn't get to meet Steven Tyler so that I only got to see the picture of Steven Tyler um, I would say so whenever we go to California to visit his old stomping grounds, we stay at this hotel called the Sunset Marquee. And apparently it's right off of Sunset Boulevard in in West Hollywood. And apparently this is where all the like celebrities would go because it's off the beaten path and it's a rock and roll hotel. Um, so we saw ZZ Top. And I did not know what ZZ Top looked like. So I can't take any credit for acknowledging who it is. But my husband was like, oh, my God, it's ZZ Top. <laughs> so the, the one, oh, my gosh, I'm blanking on her name, Amy Schumer. That was my favorite. Um, so Amy Schumer came walking by. I'm standing in the walkway 
with the luggage because my husband had left his cell phone in the cab. So he is like running to get it. I've got all the luggage. I'm like, we've already made it this far. I'm not, we're not going to walk back to the entrance. So I'm waiting there with the luggage. And here comes Amy Schumer just walking right by in like a yoga <laughs> outfit and no shoes. And she smiles at me and keeps going. And I was like, it took me a minute to process. I was like, holy cow, that's Amy Schumer. And she's just here. She was on like tour or something doing something. So that's that's so amazing. I feel like that would be my biggest fear. I, I would run into, I mean, I think the only one that I would probably actually be starstruck by might be Steven Tyler. And then my luck, I would not recognize him because it would be like out of context or something like that. So yes. um, that's, that's so that's so incredible. You know, earlier you mentioned too, um, Tony Robbins. So how did the whole Tony Robbins like um, come about for you? I, you know, I listened to um, a lot of his books on audio. So I was listening to books and um, I want to say, I'm trying to think if there, I don't think podcasts were a thing back then. So I'm trying to remember how I saw him. Um, I, this is going to sound terrible. I think Shallow How was my introduction <laughs> to mm. who is this Tony Robbins guy? And I want to say I looked it up and I just started reading and following um, a lot of his uh, different lessons, um, Awaken the Giant Within, things like that, if, if you've heard of those. So that was my introduction to him. Um, and that, I know it was before podcasts, so I'm like, there's a lot more people who do it now, but I don't remember them there being female people like him. Like, that was one thing that was really notable. It's like, wow, that's, okay, that makes sense, like a very strong masculine male presence out there, but where are female leaders who... Um, can get out there and, and send a similar message, but inspire, you know, women and, and other folks. So that's, that's kind of how it came about. And it was just, it was so inspiring. I was like, that's such a cool job to get to motivate and inspire people. It really is. Um, and I mean, to your point, 20 years ago, there weren't a lot of female leaders, not a lot of diversity, just in general, kind of in like the motivational leadership circuit. Um, but now it's just exploded. There's all kinds of great ones. And so I'm curious, I know that you do a lot of reading, listen to podcasts. What what are you listening to now or what have you read lately? Yeah, I have. So I have a nice, very weird spread of podcasts I listen to because it's entertainment to me and it depends on what mood I'm in. Um, I have ones that are, you know, work related, parenting related, true crime. I mean, we all, there's a whole, you know, thing about true crime podcasts. Um, and then there's psychology ones. So I kind of split it up. So my favorite one right now is Josh Burson. That's a, you know, more industry related podcast. And he is an HR economist and very well known in that space. So I follow his podcast. He just launched it not too long ago and I stumbled on it and I was like, oh, Josh is back. Like he kind of went into a little bit of a, a research role for a long time and came back out. Uh, Hidden Brain is also one of my favorites. Um, and then the psychology podcast um, is there. <laughs> From a book perspective, I always mix in a parenting book, like a psychology book, a self-help type book. So um, one of my, I just recently finished um, this parenting book called How to Raise Successful People. It is so good. Um, really, really kind of talks about um, as a parent, like what are the things you can do to set your kids up to be people, not just kids, like people. So I love that. Um, and then two other ones, one I'm rereading, I read a while ago and I've, I've got it back on my reread list because it was so good. And that's emotional agility, uh, really, really helpful way to think about regulating your own thoughts and feelings. And, um, that's useful. And then, um, hard to break. So I've probably, I've read a handful of books on habit setting and habit formation and habit breaking. So whether you need to create a habit or break a habit, um, but this one's actually really interesting on helping you understand the, the wiring in your mind and why habits, good or bad, are extremely hard to break. So um, that's pretty interesting one too. That's great. Um, and a nice sort of like mix of genres. Like one of the things that I found, I love to read um, as well, not a podcaster though, Interestingly enough, I've totally like I'm not on the podcast train, uh, but love to read. But one of the things that I've noticed is that uh, my my area 
that I focus on, it, it just sort of changes. Like, and, it, and it's also evolved like throughout my life um, based on all kinds of things, just like how I'm feeling, uh, where I need to develop in certain areas. Also just the people that are surrounding me because you also pick up, you know, their book recommendations that'll take you off on a whole other track. Um, I've noticed a lot around emotional resilience and habit formation and breaking. Um, what sort of led you down this path and part of your journey right now? Well, it's professionally, it comes up when I think about my role in helping individuals, team members, leaders. Um, a big part of a, a good people leader's role is coaching and helping coach leaders to be better, help coach team members to be you know, able to work through challenges and problems and, and all that. So for me, it's been through studying and understanding human behavior and how can I help people. Um, it helps me personally but then it also helps me help others. That's great. Um, I also, um, you joined us in Chicago for the Key Client Summit and shared the stage with um, one of your colleagues from Spring Health, who's also a partner of, of ours and our, and our benefits offering as well, um, and talked about emotional resilience a little bit. And it was kind of fun to see you two playing off of each other. Um, in terms of like your, it sounds like you had a close relationship in the past, some shared interest, but then also just like the challenge that uh, people offices are, are facing at this time. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about that relationship and how that's evolved over time as well? Yeah, I, you know, for me, earlier in my career, I didn't understand the value of networking. So I, I thought if I just connect to the people within the company I work for, that's great. Like that's my network. And what I realized is that the further I got in my career and moved into different type of leadership roles, um, I really needed to have other perspectives to be successful. And I couldn't just rely on my internal perspective or the people I knew in the same company. And reading books is only going to get you so far. It's very helpful, but you need kind of to have other perspectives. And so um, it was when I moved to Chicago, which is, was about 13 years ago, and I didn't know anybody, I had to build a network. So it was a great reason to kind of start creating this community of other people who do what I do and I can learn from. It's really empowering because then you don't have to have all the answers. Like that's a really valuable part of it. So I had connected with, um, with Karishma, who is the chief people officer for Spring Health. I connected with her probably six or seven years ago because we worked in the same building and we did the same thing. And that was literally how we got. So someone who knew her and knew me was like, you guys should just meet and just get to know each other. So um, we did and we helped each other and we've continued to help each other throughout um, our career. And, and she makes me smarter. And I think I help her. You know, I hope I do. She keeps talking to me, so I'm guessing I do. But <laughs> um, but the value is just having another thought partner in the process. And especially during these past three years of COVID, and the impact it's had on, you know, people's mental health and the mental health of the, the quality of the organization to have another thought partner who can, you know, we can collaborate through and try to figure out how we can help improve the experience for people and help, you know, destigmatize mental health within the workplace and, and set leaders up for success so that they can also play that part in it. So that's how Krishma and I early time got correct, connected and then how we've pulled each other through um, and supported each other. And I have a few other people like Krishma and my network that we all we all help each other. And in the whole intent is if we can help each other, we help so many more organizations and so many more people. You spread your your positive impact. For sure. Um, I love that. I, I've seen like the power of a network from everything from um, advice, like in marketing too, uh, getting creativity and inspiration from from others and how would you solve this problem or how would you design this structure, um, getting that outside perspective from others that are thinking about the same things and may have solved them in, in very different and creative ways. I think one thing that's a little bit different than maybe in the past is when you shared this example, you have an opportunity to bump into people in the building or in the hallways or have those natural collisions. Um, and in a remote world, those things have to be done more intentionally and the approach is a little bit different. And so what would be some advice that you might have for our team members that are hoping to build a network in a time where we're fully remote? So I think that webinars and conferences 
and meetups, like regional meetups, are still something that are going to be very popular and people are going to actually flock to them more because they have that craving for um, interpersonal connection. And so I think those moments where you have the opportunity to go to a meetup <laughs> or be a part of a, you know, a luncheon that you're invited to because it's going to be other people who, you know, either graduated from the school you graduated from or they're an alumni. Anywhere that you can network with people who um, either have some similar career, career professional backgrounds, I think that that is an awesome opportunity. So what I found, and I, I was encouraging the folks at our client summit, that it's like you're in a room with people who do what you do, talk to them, exchange phone numbers, <laughs> exchange emails. Like that is like the quickest and easiest way to do it. I had um, a colleague at my last company and she did Toastmasters. That thing still exists. So she did Toastmasters. And so she connected with people there because you just never know how those connections will, will help you. So I think it's a little bit easier than you'd think. You just have to be willing to talk to people when you're in in-person settings or you're in a virtual kind of conference and exchange numbers and, and help each other. That's great advice. And we do feel um, or forget about a lot of these like sort of old school networking mechanisms like Toastmasters. I just had to smile a little bit because gosh, that one's been around for a very long time. Totally. Um, so the concept of networking, building relationships and connections in a remote environment is an area that's that certainly come up quite a bit of people trying to solve that one. And then another one is work life balance. So when you're commuting to an office, it's like you that, that commute that everyone complains about is also creates a buffer and a wall and a separation between your work life and your home self. And a lot of times people are feeling that missing in the remote environment and and the work is creeping into the personal and personal is bleeding into the work. So um, what how, how do you think about work life balance and how do you create some barriers for yourselves? So I have coached people on work life balance for at least 15 years because I am a uh, a workaholic who has learned how to not be a workaholic, who's learned how to manage it so I can have work-life balance. And so because I've, I've been there mentally, I know what I know what to look for and I know some of the common causes and and typically it's associated with how you identify your value and the value that you can bring. And so there's a whole series I, I would love to eventually, you know, do a session and a webinar here on, on boundary setting and how you can set that. I say all that because it starts with work life balance starts with you and it starts with identifying boundaries and making sure that you are setting boundaries that help you. So, for instance, if one of your back one of your boundaries is you know, you've got kids that you need to take care of and that your day needs to end at 5 p.m. because you've got sports and kids and da da da, then make sure that you figure out how to set that boundary. And that might mean, I know for me, that might mean that I, if I cut off at five, then I'm probably gonna have to check a few emails later once the kids are settled or in bed. And I've established that boundary for myself instead of letting it creep past. Another boundary for me is exercise. I have to exercise. I am not my best self if I don't get at least a 30 minute workout in um, during the day. And I, usually it's like right before the kids go to school. So I'm squeezing it in in the morning. But sometimes it has to be, you know, in the middle of the day at lunch, I'm, I'm getting a 30 minute walk in so I can do something to kind of reset and, and keep my mind fresh. So establishing your own boundaries and what can you do to keep those boundaries um that's going to be key like nobody can force boundaries on you and you have to force them on yourself truly and know what's you know where you have flexibility and where you don't and and work within those parameters yeah that's such wonderful advice and and also for the leaders um that are on the call right now setting a good example for your team members I mean, I remember a couple of weeks ago, um, someone was trying to schedule some time with me and they said, well, they, they look like you're blocked, but you might be flexible. And I said, I'm actually not flexible because my son's having a football game and I'm planning to be there. And it was amazing 
how happy this team member was to hear me say that. And they said, you just gave me like such a relief and, and permission for myself to feel like I can do it. And it's almost like just reminding people that we're humans first, right? Yeah. We we have lives, we have emotional needs, and we have to manage our own industry or our, our own energy. And as leaders, part of our responsibility is managing the energy of our team as well. And to your point, modeling the way. So I, I'm just like you, I've got, my kids are in all sorts of sports and I coach, I don't know why I did this. I coach two soccer teams and like, so today it's Thursday and I have to be done right at five because I have to go and coach two different sports practices. Um, so I have those boundaries, but I will speak to it when someone's like, hey, can you take a call at five? Today I can't, I've got to go to this or or I need to end this right at this time because I have a lacrosse game for my son. I got to go watch and I don't want to miss this game. So being able to speak to that as a leader gives your team permission to, to, to say that too. And I remember not too long ago, you wouldn't tell people why you couldn't meet past five. Mm -hmm. You don't want to tell people like I've got a kid event because people, and this is probably 10 years ago, so it's not as recent, but at least 10 years ago, it would be like, oh, okay, you're not prioritizing work. It's like, no, I'm prioritizing life. Like I'm prioritizing both. And that makes me better at work because I can actually feel like I can give my best self to to both. It absolutely does. It, it does make such an incredible difference. I mean, I, I just think about my own self and my own energy when I know that I'm focusing on the areas that are most important to me and taking care of myself, taking care of my family, taking care of my home. I can show up at work and be fully present. And, to, and I have a different energy about me, a certain enthusiasm and optimism about the future and a creativity that I wouldn't have otherwise had. So it's it's totally true. So Cheryl, I have to ask you, because this is so hilarious to me. How did you end up coaching two soccer teams? Okay, so, and here's the thing. I didn't play soccer growing up, so I don't actually know. I don't know the positions. I don't know the rules, um, but... I am like true to form. I know all the kids' names and I know what motivates them. So like that, I am like the talent person. So I know who's really good at defense and who's good at offense. And I know who can play goalie, even though I don't know the actual rules. So the value I play is I'm the one who is like, oh my gosh, like this one kid, like he always plays goalie. And so one day we had him play offense and he don't ask me what position because I don't I just know it was offense. And so and he did so good. So it was after that. I'm like, nope, JP is always playing offense. Like he thought he was a goalie, but he's not. He's really, really good. And he's loving it. And he's, you know, he's thriving. But the reason I started doing it was just because I really felt like I was missing out on being a part of my kids life outside of the home. And when before the pandemic, I had to, you know, commute into the office every day. I worked, you know, I'd leave the house at 630 in the morning and I'd get home 630 or seven o'clock at night. And so I wasn't the one that took the kids to school. I wasn't the one that helped them with their homework. I wasn't able to volunteer at the school functions. I was the mom that always came and saw all the other moms and dads like participating. And I was I felt guilty that I wasn't you know, able to be more involved. And then the pandemic hit. And for me, that was the blessing of working remotely. And I, we live five minutes from the school and seven minutes from the fields where the soccer games are. So it's really close and convenient. And it, it occurred to me that I can have both. I can, you know, have an, a career that's really important to me and to the family, and I can also be involved. And so Soccer was what I just wanted to help with their sports. Um, I was a cheerleader in high school, so I, I played softball, but I was really a cheerleader. So I liked being supportive, even if I didn't actually play the game. So I volunteered to coach with the head coach and she played soccer in college. So she knows the rules. So that's where I'm like, I'm her backup. I'm like, I don't know the rules and you have to be at every game because if, if you're not, we're going to be in big trouble. So that's that's how I signed up for it. And I've done it now for this is season four. So they do spring, summer, fall. So it's, you know, a year and a half. And I love it. And I know all the kids. I know all my kids' friends. And they you know I'm the, the one that, you know, cheers them on and supports them. That's so wonderful. I love it. I did um, one season as an assistant coach on uh, the baseball team. And my husband was like, 
what do you know about baseball? And I'm like, I don't know, but I'm on the coaching staff and um, <laughs> at the games, I would sit in the dugout and, and they'd be like, I don't think you're allowed back there. And I said, I'm I'm with, I'm on the coaching staff. I'm I'm allowed back here. Uh, certain privileges. So Cheryl, I gotta tell you, and and I'm sorry, this is so non sequitur, but there are a lot of comments in the chat about your background. So oh, yeah. first of all, is is this a virtual background or is this the real deal? No, nope, this is the real deal. So this the office is blue. The whole office is blue. The ceiling is blue. The bookshelves are blue. The walls are blue. Um, when I moved into this house, um, it was during the pandemic and I realized that I was going to be working remotely and a corner in my bedroom with my six year old's play desk was not going to suffice. That's literally where I was working at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and so when I moved into this house, this office was all cherry wood. It was very masculine. Um, it was definitely an office, but not for a female um, from my perspective. And so I wanted to make it more, um, I really wanted to make it feminine, but not too feminine. And so my really good friends and designer, we went through like six different colors of blue to get <laughs> to this blue. But yes, it's blue and um, with a couple pops of color. And, and I have a fish tank that is basically a water feature. So I think because I can hear it, so I feel like it's a very zen office. Oh, well, it's it's stunning. I've noticed that in the past as well, and you're getting a lot of kudos for that. Um, so the zen water feature helps you relax. How else do you relax? How do you unwind? So I was thinking about that because I don't know that I do very much. Like I would like to say that I do, but my whole family and everybody knows me says I do not. So, but I, you know, when I have my kids every other week, so the weeks I have the boys, there's zero relaxing. It is sports, sports, homework, cooking, work, like all sorts of stuff. So there's zero relaxing the weeks I have them, the weeks I don't have them. Um, I, you know, exercise, that's a big thing. I, I love to exercise. And then I like to shop, I like to eat, and I like to sleep. That's how. And then Netflix. I love Netflix. So whenever I do get a chance to be in charge of the TV remote, I definitely will turn on some Netflix stuff. Well, wait a second. What are you watching on? What are you watching right now? Okay, so I just finished Queen Charlotte, and I highly mm -hmm. recommend it. If you haven't watched it, it was very good. Um, and now I don't feel like, I feel like I've probably watched too many things. There's not much. I'm watching Beef. It's very interesting. It's odd. It's a little dark humor, but that's really good. Um, so, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, it, and the Queen Charlotte, that's a the Bridgerton. Yeah. Right. Okay. It's yes. like a life story. So it's really, it's surprisingly really good. Okay. So I, um, I just recently got into um, the ambassador, Carrie Russell. Oh, I and saw that. Yeah. is it good? Yeah, I just started it and it's, it's really good so far. And then on the plane, started watching a show called Ghosts. And that one is awesome. Oh, I, I'm it's really into that right now. Regular TV. Mm -hmm. oh, I think it's, it's a CBS perfect. show. Yes, it's so good, except it's like 20 minutes of actual content. <laughs> that's yes. the downside. That, see, that's the best part of it. It's like quick hits, lighthearted laughter, um, good way to unwind. If anyone wants to put other recommendations in our chat, we'd love to see them. I'm always on the hunt for the next book or show. Um, Cheryl, with our last couple of minutes, um, I think I'd really just love to ask you, you know, you've been here for four months. You've had an opportunity to meet a lot of people and and see what's going on. What advice do you have for our team members right now? Oh, um, I would say one, use your voice. And so a big thing that the people team is really going to start focusing on is co-creating the experience. And, and what I mean by that is this is your experience. We are here to help facilitate and help um, bring it to life, but we need it to be co-created and we want to hear from team members. So I think using your voice when you're you know, asked to take a survey or participate in focus groups because you really can help shape the experience that you have and your team members have. Um, and then the other thing is from a career development is really important and we saw it in the engagement survey that that's still an area of opportunity for us and that um, people still feel like there's not as much either clarity on the opportunities or their expectations just aren't being totally met on on that. So that is we're very aware. 
it's a priority. Um, but the best advice I have for anybody on your career is that nobody will care more about your career than you because it's your career. Even if you've got an amazing advocate for a leader, they're still never going to care as much as you do. So knowing that it's your career and you're going to care more than anybody and you should care more than anybody about your career is make your interests known. Ask for help and feedback. Um, that's a really important part of it. And then when you get feedback, don't fight the feedback. <laughs> so if you get feedback, there's always something useful with feedback. You may not entirely agree with it. It's someone else's perception, but it matters. And using that feedback to go, where's the truth in this feedback and what can I learn from it? Use your voice, ask for feedback and make your interest known. That's wonderful. Wonderful advice, Cheryl. Thank you so much for spending your time with us, for joining us, and, and also for sharing your experience. Um, we're just so lucky to have you here and, and really thankful to hear from you today.